Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we introduce instrumental conditioning. Together with Pavlovian conditioning, instrumental conditioning is the other classic topic of animal learning research. In this lesson, we look at how instrumental conditioning works and how it differs from Pavlovian conditioning. There is also a lot in common between them, which we will cover in future lessons. In instrumental conditioning, animals learn actions based on their consequences. That is, they learn to repeat actions with positive consequences and to avoid actions with negative consequences. The typical laboratory example of instrumental conditioning is a rat that learns to press a lever to get food, a positive consequence, or to avoid shock, a negative consequence. It is also common to train pigeons to pack a key or a touch screen. In the same sense that Pavlovian conditioning is associated with Ivan Pavlov, instrumental conditioning is associated with American psychologist Burroughs Frederick Skinner, or B.F. Skinner. Skinner was not the first to study what we now call instrumental conditioning. Edward Thorndike, for example, had studied how animals learn new behaviors before Skinner. Skinner, however, has been the most influential researcher in the field. In fact, some years ago, Skinner has been ranked the most eminent psychologist of the 20th century, surpassing even Freud, who was number three. For the record, Thorndike was number nine and Pavlov number 24. Let's see how we can train a rat to perform a simple action like pressing a lever. This involves a few steps, and the whole technique is called shaping because it allows us to shape the animal's behavior. Shaping is one of the most important techniques in animal training. Here we see a rat in a training apparatus. This is essentially a box with a few things that the rat can do, a few stimuli that can be shown to the rat, and some electronics to automate its operation and the recording of behavior. This particular box has two levers that the rat can press, a speaker that can play sounds, a feeder to deliver food, and a metal grid floor that can be used to shock the rat's feet. As an aside, experimental psychologists do not enjoy shocking animals, keeping them hungry or doing anything unpleasant. These are necessary evils so that we can learn about learning, which can help both animals and people. The box also registers automatically when the rat presses the lever or enters the food magazine. The idea that the learning experiment could be fully automated using technology is one of Skinner's contributions, and nowadays most people use the term Skinner box. During experiments, the Skinner boxes are kept in soundproof cabinets so that the animal is not distracted by what goes on outside the box. Let's see now how we can train the rat. We see that the rat is quite active in the box. This is because it is hungry. We cannot tell the rat, look, you can press the lever and food will come out. And this is the problem that shaping solves for us. It is a way to communicate with the animal, if you wish. First, we tell the rat that you have to be close to the lever, and we do this by giving it food any time it approaches the lever. The delivery of food is marked in the video by a green dot. At this point, the rat does not need to press or even touch the lever. It gets food by simply being close to it. Once the rat does this reliably, we tell it, now you have to touch the lever. Again, we don't say this in words, but we say it by giving food only when the rat actually touches the lever. The final step is to reward with food only when the rat puts enough weight on the lever to actually depress it. Once it does this a few times, the training is complete. We have trained the rat to press the lever for food. Let's reflect a bit on what we have seen and ask ourselves why shaping works. In a nutshell, shaping works because animals are constantly trying out new things. We could not train a rat that just sits still all the time this rat would never even get close to the lever. More generally, we cannot reward or punish behavior that never happens. We can only train behaviors that are within reach of the animal. Training must proceed in appropriately small steps. If we follow these guidelines, we can train almost anything that the animal can do. For example, this rat has been trained to turn around for food. In the examples we watched, the training used the reward but one can also use punishment. For example, we could train the rat to not touch the lever by shocking it every time it did so. 
Collectively, rewards and punishments are called reinforcers. A reinforcement is anything that can make a behavior more or less likely. Skinner did not like punishment and preferred to train behavior by reward. There are at least three good reasons. First, it's nicer for the animal. Second, punishment conveys less information to the animal. When we punish the animal, we are telling it what not to do, but we are not saying much about what it should do. When we use a reward, the animal can just repeat what it just did to earn more rewards. Lastly, punishment often makes animals afraid to explore their environment, so it's hard for them to stumble on the behavior we want to train. For shaping to work, it is important that the reward is appropriate to the behavior we want to train. For example, Shatterward offered sunflower and seeds to hamsters when they performed either of two behaviors, rearing, which means standing up, or washing their face. Washing is a natural behavior in hamsters, like in many animals. They don't use soap and water, of course, but they lick their paws and scrub their face with them. The results of the experiment are in this graph. As we can see, Rearing increased a lot when it was reinforced with sunflower seeds, while washing did not increase at all. So washing cannot be reinforced with sunflower seeds. It turns out it's hard to reinforce washing at all, although you can reduce it somewhat by punishing it. The take-home message from these and many other similar experiments that have been done is that each reward or punishment is only effective on certain behaviors. Usually, these are the behaviors that the animal naturally performs when looking for that reward or trying to avoid that punishment. We cannot reward washing with food because washing is not one of the things that hamsters do when looking for food. On the other hand, food usually works on many behaviors because many animals naturally try out many things when hungry, like manipulating objects or moving around. We will come back to this topic in a future lesson. Let's say something about the role of stimuli in instrumental conditioning now. In Pavlovian conditioning, we know that animals learn to react to the conditioned stimulus, the CS, with a response, the CR, and that this depends on the CS having been paired with the unconditioned stimulus, the US. So far, we have not said anything about how stimuli enter instrumental conditioning. Rather, we are focused on how an action is learned. Here, I just want to observe that the appropriate action depends on the situation. For example, we all learn that you can eat yellow bananas, but that green ones are not so great. We are using a stimulus, the color of the banana, to decide whether to eat or not. Animals can use stimuli in a similar way, to understand, so to speak, in which situation they are, and therefore what is appropriate to do. For example, it is easy to train a rat to press a lever when a light is on, but not when the same light is off. If we introduce this rule into our instrumental conditioning experiment, the rat will learn quickly that it is useless to press when the light is off. We will go into more detail in future lessons, but for now we should keep in mind that animals can learn different actions depending on what stimuli they are perceiving. This means that there are three things that are important in instrumental conditioning. What stimuli are there, what actions the animal can do, and what are the outcomes of these actions. Now that we have seen a bit of how instrumental conditioning works, let's compare it to Pavlovian conditioning. In Pavlovian conditioning, the CS-US relationship is arranged completely by us. In other words, what happens is beyond the animal's control. The animal just reacts by learning whatever behavior it thinks is appropriate. We cannot change the behavior that the animal learns. We cannot train a dog to sit by Pavlovian conditioning. If we use a food US, the dog will salivate, get excited, wag its tail, and so on when it perceives the CS, but it will not learn any behavior that it does not spontaneously do when waiting for food. In instrumental conditioning, on the other hand, we arrange a relationship between a behavior and a reinforcer. The animal can try out different behaviors, but only the one that we have chosen is reinforced. Even if there are some limitations, as seen in the previous slide, we are free to pick up pretty much any behavior. In future lessons, we will see that Pavlovian and instrumental learning have also many things in common. Exactly how they are related is one of the big open questions in animal learning. We will talk about it in a future lesson, once we have learned some more about learning. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions of what to study next. Happy learning to everyone.